Plush interiors, unnecessarily extravagant features, and a ride softer than a Pomeranian puppy's fur. Luxury cars offer the richest of the rich the opportunity to drive around in cars with an insane level of comfort. But what if you could get that level of comfort for a fraction of the price? How's it going, people? Today I'm going to be showing you five cars in the luxury car market that cost less than £20,000 thanks to excessive depreciation. That is 10 times cheaper than a Rolls Royce Wraith is brand new. In fact, it's more than 10 times cheaper. And by the way, I'm ordering those cars from least to most brake horsepower in order to reduce any personal bias. It's important to remember that these cars were very expensive when they were first sold, which means they're very expensive to maintain and keep running today. Not to mention tax, insurance, and all that kind of stuff. Also, don't forget that I'm in the UK, so prices in other countries may differ. But with that in mind, let me know in the comments down below if you could only have luxury or performance, which one would you have? If you enjoy the video and want to see more like this, 500 likes, and I will do a second version of this video because I've got plenty more cars that could have fit into it. Also, liking the video helps the algorithm, which helps me out, and it takes zero time for you, so I'd be gassed if you did. But without further ado, let's get into the video. <laughs> I almost made this video without using any German badges at all, but realize you basically can't make a video on luxury cars without mentioning the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, specifically the sixth generation W222 S350 CDI, which hosts a three liter turbo diesel V6 engine, putting out 255 brake horsepower, which takes it from zero to 60 in 6.9 seconds. The design was inspired by the F700 concept car, revealed at the 2007 Frankfurt Motor Show, but the S-Class didn't actually arrive until 2013. In my opinion, it looks a lot more like the Executive C-Class Saloon than the F700, but that's not to say I'm not a fan of its looks. Aesthetics aren't actually the most important feature on an S-Class though. These cars are renowned for being ahead of the curve with their technology in the full-size luxury car class. This was the first S-Class with fiber optic cables handling all electrical systems in the car, but more impressively, it has a system named Magic Body Control, which scans the surface of the road 15 meters ahead and adjusts the suspension at each wheel to account for whatever imperfections it finds, meaning theoretically an incredibly comfortable ride. Now if that isn't luxury, I don't know what is. Of course, it's not as luxurious as its Maybach equivalent, but it still provides a horrendously nice place to be with its leather interior and choice of different trims on the dashboard. All the features you'd like, including heating and cooling seats, a million and one adjustments on the dash, a centre console bigger than my future, all tied together with a nice analogue clock in the dashboard. Very classy. Now these started at around £70,000 when they were new, but now they're available for as little as £15,000 with high mileage and 20 grand will get you in with around 50 to 100,000 miles on the clock, depending on whether you go for an AMG line or something a tad cheaper. However, I would be slightly worried about reliability on this one. Plenty of owners on forums have noted problems with the electrical features of the car, which can be annoying in terms of luxury but don't actually affect the driving. Unless, of course, the wiring to the stop start gets a bit sketchy, which isn't unheard of. The engines have also been quite inconsistent. If you check online, you'll see plenty that have done upwards of 200 thousand miles in under seven years, probably used as taxis or whatever, but some owners note problems with them, as well as with the suspension packing up, which is a nice four-figure bill. All in all, certainly a luxury car, but I would maybe feel a little bit stressed about the idea of having to look after one. Also, I'd probably want someone to drive me around in one, rather than be the one driving. Now, Mercedes might be a respected brand, but I would argue they're not quite aimed at the same level of the luxury market as Aston Martin. For £20,000, you can just about get your hands on a V8 Vantage with quite high miles, and I've seen them listed even cheaper than this in the past. It was priced at £79,000 when new in 2006, which would be £115,000 today if you factor in the inflation over that time, so the fact that you can get so many at around the 20k mark shows how bad the depreciation has hit. This is mostly because it was mass produced in Aston Martin terms, with only the DB9 selling as many units as the Vantage. It has a 4.3 litre V8 engine, putting out 380 brake horsepower, which was taken from 0 to 60 in 4.9 seconds, which is pretty rapid, if only because this car is more in the middle of sports and luxury. Contrary to the S-Class, it's only got two seats, which means it's luxury for those of you with fewer friends. It was displayed at the Geneva Motor Show in 2005 and came on sale for the 2006 model year. This 4.3 litre engine only lasted a couple of years before it was replaced by the 4.7 litre V8 instead, but there aren't any of those in our price range. The focus of the car was to be a sporty, luxurious Grand Tourer, hence they went for a hatchback style boot for extra practicality and a large luggage shelf behind the seats, so it isn't an entirely impractical sports car. More importantly, on the Top Gear Awards in 2005 it became one of 
only two cars to be placed in the DB9 section, which was the extra category added to the cool wall to be even cooler than Sub-Zero. Car designers all generally seemed to agree at the time it was one of the best looking cars available as it won numerous design awards. A major positive of going for this car is the reliability. One day it'll appear in a high performance, high reliability video because owners generally note a few very minor issues here and there like water getting into one of the lights and causing the indicators to malfunction and there are a few issued fixes for the car over the years so worth checking to see that the one you're interested in has all of these but ultimately your key issue will be the servicing costs. Even then many owners note years of services costing under a thousand pounds before any major expenditure was required. It is in mine and many others opinion a stunning looking car, looks rich and is well worth its place on this list. Heading from the north to the south of Europe now and a manufacturer that has been a little bit up and down with its offerings over the past few years. I'm talking about Maserati and more specifically their recently cancelled Gran Turismo, which if nothing else sounds absolutely amazing. <laughs> Also, I forgot to say this before, massive thank you for 36,000 subscribers. That just seems insane in my head. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you click down below because I post twice a week here. And also go follow on Instagram at Cars with JB where I post every single day, mostly car content. That sound comes from its Ferrari Maserati Collab 4.2 litre V8 engine, which puts out 399 brake horsepower, but is not quite as quick as the Aston with a 0 to 60 time of five seconds. Though it may be a luxury car, it sets a very strange record. It was the most quickly developed car in the automotive industry as it went from design to production in just nine months because apparently when Ferrari sold Maserati to Fiat they took with them the original plans for the Maserati Coupe's replacement so the designers had to come up with something new fast. I'll probably tell that story in more detail in a future video if people are interested. Let me know in the comments down below. It derives from the Quattroporte platform and is focused on being a comfortable Grand Tourer. These were decently speckable even back when they were first on sale in 0708, so despite being dated, if you look hard enough you'll find some with stunning specs both inside and out. I personally am a big fan of the red leather clamshell interior with the Trident etched into the headrests. Both the exterior and the interior were designed by Pininfarina too, so style is what you'd expect. These are listed for as little as £18,000 and 20 grand will get you a 2008 model with around 50,000 miles on the clock. Of course, a Ferrari Maserati engine may not strike the most confidence when it comes to reliability or at least maintenance costs and your worries would certainly be well founded at least in the latter point. Owners note that maintenance isn't cheap, also the gearbox isn't the most reliable and costs an arm and a leg to fix. On the engine, it's not all bad though, with the main issues I can see being oil leaks. It's the electronics that seem to have the biggest issue, intermittently working and then dying. But all in all, a Pininfarina designed, Ferrari engined, Italian Grand Tourer. I think you'd be absolutely gassed with your purchase until you had to service it or something like that. When I think of luxury cars, I always think big. Big engines, big interior, big ego, and big overall size, though some might argue this is a negative correlation with the size of the owner's appendage. But thinking of the big for a moment, easily the biggest car on this list is the first generation facelifted Land Rover Range Rover Sport, with its 5 litre supercharged V8 engine, which puts out a massive 502 brake horsepower, taking it from 0 to 60 in 6 seconds. Now that sounds great, but you'll need a wallet to match, as road tax is £580 per year and fuel economy is around 19 miles per gallon, not particularly environmentally or monetarily friendly. The car was designed by Jerry McGovern, a well-respected designer who is also responsible for the MGF, as well as the Freelander, which was the best-selling compact SUV in Europe for seven years. The car was based on the Range Stormer concept and has a whole bunch of interesting features in terms of how it was designed to remain dynamic on the road, despite its size and weight. I've spoken about these features in a previous video though, so check that out if you want to hear more. Simply put, the special chassis, suspension and electronic tech all work together to keep the car handling accessible. Acceptably. The interior is clean and understated and having been in one I can say everything did feel very real and of decent quality, which I say reluctantly as I'm actually not a fan of these cars. They're also far more capable off-road than people will ever likely use them for. I spoke with a Land Rover employee about this and was told, it's kind of like how no one will really ever use the full potential of a supercar on the roads. No one will ever use the full potential of our 4x4s on the road. It's just nice to know that they have that potential if the opportunity arose. This is 
brought a stigma to these cars though, correct or otherwise, with people naming them Chelsea tractors, as rich parents can be seen driving their kids to school in them. But you don't have to be a rich parent, as you can get one of these for as little as £14,000 with very high miles, or 20 grand, and you're looking at around 30 to 40,000 miles on the clock, which is actually quite reasonable. On reliability, the key issue I could find is related to the air suspension going wrong as a result of the air compressor, which isn't an uncommon problem. Some owners profess to swapping them out to coilovers to minimise the expense of replacing them. Another relatively common issue is vibration through the steering wheel, which is due to the steering rack and can be resolved with a zamper. Overall, a very large luxury car with a massive engine and a fair amount of presence, but it has nothing on the might of the top car on this list. Now, all previous cars have provided some level of luxury with some level of prestige to their badges, but we have to finish this video with a car from a manufacturer which is almost indisputably focused on luxury, the Bentley Continental GT, or if you want a bit more practicality, or you have a chauffeur, the Flying Spur. Released in 2003, this is the oldest car on the list, and was a stark contrast to many previous Bentleys as it wasn't a coach-built car, and was mass-produced, which you could say takes away a bit from the exclusivity side of expensive luxury cars, this also is a key reason as to why it's depreciated so heavily. It hosts a 6-litre W12 twin-turbocharged engine, putting out 552 brake horsepower and can do 0-60 in 4.8 seconds, 0.1 of a second faster than the Aston Martin, partially thanks to its all-wheel drive layout. Even though it was mass-produced, the focus was still clearly on building a luxury car, as it was originally given a large number of spec options for the time, particularly on the interior, and Bentley even got luxury watchmaker Breitling to make the dashboard clock for them. In 2005, the Mulliner driving specification was also made available, which gave a more sporty feel to the luxury, with larger alloys, better tyres, drilled alloy pedals and footrest, and a bunch of other cool spec options like the two-tone leather and veneer combinations, diamond quilting on the leather, and Bentley embroidery throughout the car. The Flying Spur is that bit less focused though, and more refined when it comes to being a luxury car, the kind of car you'd expect old rich people to be wafting around in, rather than something slightly younger people with cash might want to get into. The key differences are pretty obvious. Number one, it's a saloon. Number two, it has more space for passengers in the rear. And number three, it's got more doors. £14,000 is about the minimum you can spend to get into a Continental GT, which sounds ridiculous, and for 20 grand you'll get a Mulliner with around 60,000 miles on the clock, which is still nuts. You'll be very pleased to know too that the mechanical reliability is very positive. The W12 has done many owners proud for many miles. That's not to say that it wouldn't cost an arm and leg if that complicated block did go wrong though, so do be wary that you might not be paying Bentley money for the car, but you will be paying Bentley money for the maintenance and any repairs. It's a VW Group car, so coil packs have been known to go, which costs around £350 for a set, which would only be £25 on the Polo, for example. The key advice I found from owners is that a full service history on a high mileage car is better than one that has low mileage but has just been stored for a really long time and doesn't have those stamps. All in all, a mad car to be buying a fund of £20,000 and certainly looks a lot more expensive. So I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you learned something. If you did, hit the like button, 500 likes and a part two will come. Massive thank you to the patrons as always, remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that great stuff, but thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Listen.